Okay, I think we're probably as many people here as we're going to have right now. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining me today. My name is Wade Ellery. I'm with Radiant Logic. I'm one of our senior solutions architects. We're one of the premium sponsors here at the Cloud Identity Summit. We've been attending since way back in the days of Vail, if any of you go back that far in your uh, alumni ship at uh, CIS. Um, we are going to be doing a combination today of a presentation and a live demo. Uh, as you're probably familiar with Mariah Carey's mishap on New Year's Eve, live demos can go horribly wrong. So with my fingers crossed and my connection to AWS doesn't fall, everything should be fine. You'll be able to see quite a bit of functionality operating in the real world in terms of the way the product operates. But just to let you know, if I start singing and dancing, that's because the back end fell out. Um, what we're really talking about today is three major subjects. We're covering them with a little bit of redundancy between each. The way the workshops are set up, they uh, allow us that kind of overlap. So we're really addressing initially here the challenge of web access management and why web access management needs a federated identity service. One of the challenges in our industry is vocabulary. Uh, we tend to use the same words to mean different things. If you say MDM to one guy, it's master data management. It's everything in the environment that's got identity points to it. The guy next to him says, no, that's mobile data management. I don't know what you're talking about. It's all about my mobile devices and how I lock them down when they're stolen. So the same challenge we have in identity, the space with the use of the word federation. Federation was an early adoption by Ping to explain federating or single sign-on for applications that are provided through a service provider or a SaaS provider or a cloud application in many cases. Applications that use SAML and WSFED and other protocols to allow you to externalize authentication and provide single sign-on to those applications. But for us at Radiant Logic, federated means something different. We work on the identity side of the equation, as you'll see in a moment. So for us, federation is bringing together multiple sources of identity. And in large, complex organizations, the ones we deal with every day, that's the bread and butter of their biggest challenge, is that their identities, the information they need to provide for authentication, authorization, auditing, provisioning, application access, is scattered over multiple platforms. And these platforms don't play well with each other. So this has really been an industry uh, driver that has exploded recently in the last, say, the last four or five years, and really driven by the, the fact that all three axes on this little uh, cube here, created by Forrester originally, I think you probably, it's probably been reused by everybody. We've, we've taken it from them. Um, you, you see in all three directions an explosion in the amount and the complexity of the environment you're dealing with. On the bottom right-hand side, we used to own the employees. They used to be inside our environment. Uh, we could wipe their desktops every night. We had everything locked down. We controlled their credentials. But now we're dealing with contractors. We're dealing with customers and partners, people outside our organization, people who may bring their own identity with them or who I may need to provision uh, on a very shallow basis based on a little bit of information about them. Or on the customer or member side, identities that become very important to the business side of the uh, company. The revenue generating side of the company finds them critical and I need to make sure I take extra care in those areas. Or if you're in a case in the healthcare, uh, patient's information becomes even more uh, confidential and critical to manage from a security standpoint. And going off the vertical axis there, my applications all used to be inside the, uh, the perimeter, inside my firewall. I owned them all. I developed them all. Now we're using SaaS applications hosted by someone else externally. I've got applications running off of a partner that I may not even have a clear view or sight into. And now I'm doing more and more with outsourcing my applications off the premise. In fact, many of our customers now have a cloud-first initiative coming down from their highest levels of IT executives basically saying that every opportunity you have to do something externally to host that application, to go to a service, you'll take that route first than having something internally. But that gives you far less control and far less visibility into that world. And then on the bottom left-hand side, my devices have exploded also in the same kind of diversity. I used to own the machines. I could wipe them every night. I had virus scanning on every one of them. I knew they were locked down. I knew exactly what hardware I was running. And now I've got a CFO sitting at a Starbucks with his son's jailbroken iPad trying to access company financials over an open Wi-Fi network that may not even be Starbucks. I got to know a lot more about that transaction than just an ID and a password to make sure that I'm giving secure information or authorizing the right transaction. So all three of these areas have really blown up uh, the identity management space. 
And all that's really left for us to control, because we don't have perimeter anymore, we don't have application control, we don't have constituent control, is controlling those identities themselves. It's actually getting my arms around what those identities are, being able to manage them, being able to provision them properly, deprovision them properly, and audit them properly, and then do my authentication authorization over as rich a profile of user information as possible. But that goes back to our basic challenge. Uh, historically, IT was all sort of a silo-based business. I wrote my own application, I wrote my own database, I filled with my own users, you had to ask me to be added, and everything worked fine within my little world, but don't ask me to share with the guy next to me or the guy across the country. So our applications didn't do a really good job of interacting together, but that drove a lot of overhead for customers and for employees and, and contractors. And we still have that today. It's, it's crazy at this point in the industry that the number of people we talk to that have 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 logons and passwords to different applications that they have to use to do their job. And I, I'm a victim of the same thing. I sat there this morning under my breath saying nasty things about different online accounts. I had to try and figure out which password of the five that I use that are somewhat secure, insecure, and spread all over was the one that I had forgotten that I used on this particular account. So that's a challenge that we deal with by bringing in single sign-on, by the idea of, of let's aggregate all of our, our identities together, aggregate all of our applications together, one set of credentials, one set of uh, identifiers, and we'll give that user access. And in the web access management space, we use proprietary shims and, and web-based applications to get those applications all in one place. It still doesn't solve the problem of applications that are completely standalone, that have their own black box and won't interact out externally or use fat clients still. But for the web application uh, systems, I can get them into one environment and I can use a, a major product to do that. It might be CA SiteMinder, which is now CA Single Sign-On, was one of the original players of NetTegrity that put this together. Ping Federate uh, now has Ping Access, and Ping Access is their web access management layer that fits in there. All the major players in the access management space have a tool that will do this for web applications. But the challenge that's common to all those platforms is my back end still looks like the other half of the mess. I still have multiple AD domains. They may be untrusted. I may have user overlap between multiple domains. I may have different schemas. I've got information in databases that needs to be used to feed in authentication or authorization information to different applications. I have a whole myriad of data. And when I ask my access management layer to sort this out, it's a big challenge for those platforms. They have some tools for simply chaining together different backend sources of identity, but they're not built to actually sort out user overlap, protocol changes, structure changes, all the things that are inherently a challenge with having as many backends as I have. And historically, what we've done to solve the problem for application customization is we've actually spun up new backends, new directories, new environments, and populated those and synchronized those from our source of truth, made AD or HR, so that I have now a custom LDAP directory to serve a particular purpose for a particular application that I have a constituency of users I want to include in or I have a certain protocol or a certain standard I have to apply that I didn't want to put into my other resources. So this only grows larger and larger and you can see from this illustration how simple this environment is. There's only four sources and four internal apps but I already have a massive number of lines streaking around. Now imagine that when you're talking about a major corporation with 1,800 to 2,000 applications, 80 LDAP directories, 24 AD domains, and gosh knows how many databases feeding them back in, that becomes untenable. And, 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 and excuse me, uh, rolling out any additional applications, adding additional uh, resources to that environment becomes an exponentially difficult problem because now you're connecting to multiple places, you're having to deal with this, uh, this layer uh, in multiple different ways, and if you bring in a new constituency, if you acquire another organization and try to merge them into this mess, you're just adding more complexity to the model. So Radiant Logic's solution for this, and we've been at this for 15 years, so this is a solution that we know works. This is what actually the real world has come back and told us over and over again is necessary to be able to deal with that complexity on the back end and to feed, in this particular situation, your web access management portal with exactly the identities it needs, exactly in the schema, exactly in the protocol, exactly in the format, in the filtered set of identities that you want to deliver 
at the speed of a directory. So to do that, you need to be able to connect to all the different backend platforms. But understanding they're all different protocols, they're all different schemas. Even with an Active Directory, I can have different schemas depending on the way things have been extended. So I can't just drop everything into one big bucket, shake it up, and expect it all to fit together. I have to understand how to bring these into a common format and a common infrastructure, which we do in our LDAP sandbox uh, area within the uh, integration layer, and then be able to transform and translate that information, be able to join identities together across multiple platforms, understanding that Jay Smith in one system and Jay Smith in another may be different people. Or Jay Smith in one system and 147895 may be Jay Smith in another platform. And I have to understand how to bring those identities together because you only get single sign-on if there's only one identity for each user across this whole pool of users. But you want to make sure that when you're joining together identities to make a rich identity profile, you're not inadvertently joining together the wrong people. And this, al this also, does, it's not illustrated on this particular slide, but this is a schema independent, application independent, platform independent, and location independent solution. We are standards based and, and otherwise completely independent. So if the application or the source of identity information is on premise, is at a customer's location, is sitting in the cloud, if we can connect to it and we have a way of getting the information out, which is usually through a standard protocol, LDAP for AD and LDAP directory, JDBC for databases, web services, REST, SKIM, we can bring that information in and build it into the global profile. So where that sits in the infrastructure, and this is an adaptation of a slide that Gartner put together. Gartner had four pillars of identity management. The provisioning, identity management, self-service, password management pillar on the left. The access management pillar here in the center. The audit compliance and role pillar on the right. And then it had a directory services pillar as the fourth pillar. But what we realized was that it really isn't three pillars or four pillars in parallel. It's those three main consumers of identity sitting on the directory services infrastructure, sitting on your sources of identity. There's a foundational layer that feeds all of those different sources. And that is usually made up of all the different sources of identity across the bottom here, um, individually acting and connecting up to the uh, applications or the consumers of identity on top. But as we saw in the previous picture, that crisscross of lines, all those connectors, all those custom uh, scripts that we've written to extract that data and transform it and translate it to try and get it into a common format for a particular single use are very heavy, very brutal, very difficult to support. So here with Radiant Logic, sitting at this layer between your sources of identity and all the consumers of identity, you follow along with our philosophy, which is do the heavy lifting once but use it over and over and over again. If you're building a compliance solution, and there's a number of major compliance solutions on the market today that'll connect to multiple backends, pull all the information to a database, munge all that data around, and give you a list of users you can do attestation against. That's great for attestation and reporting and compliance. You can't authenticate against those users now. So if you've gone ahead and set up your access management solution to chain together five directories for authentication so you can get everyone's single sign-on, that's great for that particular model, except it really kind of falls down from a performance standpoint. But you can't also do audit and compliance reporting against all that work. So build it once at the Radiant Logic level. Let us use our experience, our GUI-based tools, our wizards, the logic engine within our platform to build a single global profile for you, and then create views of that information, segment that data into the subsets of fields and attributes, labels and schemas in the way your applications need it and then provide it in the protocol they want to consume it in. If it's a reporting tool that wants to read a SQL database, we can look like a SQL database and you can do SQL queries against that data as we do with Secure Onyx and other reporting and compliance platforms. If it needs to see it through a SKIM interface, we can make, express it through SKIM. If it's a mobile app that needs it through REST, I can take Active Directory user objects, combine them with SAP roles, put them into a single profile, and send them out as a REST query back to a mobile app sitting on a phone if you've got an API gateway set up. So all that complexity can be managed at our level and used over and over and over again, even down to the layer of doing provisioning and synchronizing passwords around your environment. Because again, we're already connected to all these back ends, so leverage that system again and again. 
Today's focus is really around the access management piece. This has been the bread and butter. It's been was the revenue driver for Radiant Logic is solving that challenge. Uh, a lot of people have come back and said, my, my federated access solution or my, my single sign-on solution, I hate it. We're ripping it out. We're getting a new one. It's too hard to work with. It's too complex. Policies are too complex to set up. It's not really the problem with the application. The application does a really good job of session management, does a good job of providing a portal, it does a good job of, of aggregating multiple applications together, but it doesn't do a good job of sorting out the complexity of the back-end identity space. So instead of ripping out the access management layer, give it a boost. Give it a, a single plane to go to to get all the information it needs to be able to do authentication and authorization in exactly the protocol and the structure that it wants it will run so much smoother. It will be so much easier to configure. Your policies will get so much smaller. It really makes the system work. And all the money you invested, all the subject matter expertise you have, and whatever that access management layer is, can be reused and, and can be leveraged because now we solve the biggest complex problem that that access management layer itself can't handle. So what we're going to do is step into a demo shortly and just wanted to give you an idea of, of the environment that we've created. This is running on my laptop. Luckily, they're making these massively beefy Xeon 8 core, 60, 32 gig machines that travel in my backpack. And um, I can run now multiple uh, virtual environments. I've got two AD domains, San Francisco and New York there with the little green and the yellow pyramids. Those are untrusted. I've got a vendor database, which is an OpenGJ LDAP database as another source, which overlaps users. I've got a store employees database. I've got an HR database. I've got a Salesforce connection with uh, profiles, provision, and Salesforce that I've actually pulled back into my environment. And I've got separate customer environments with customer loyalty and, and customer database information. And then HDAP is our local store. HDAP is the technology within Radiant Logic that lets us store information at our layer. So not only are we able to logically pull together all the data that we talked about and transform the protocols and the schemas and the standards from all these different sources, but as we great, create a global profile, as we build a relationship and a join between all these back ends, we want to be able to make a copy of that result. Creating that profile takes overhead, it takes time. You don't want to query all this information in real time on the back end to build that profile when a user comes in to authenticate or authorize themselves. You want to have that pre-built. But you need to be able to listen to the back ends for changes because if there's an update to that data, you want the decisions at our layer to be made based on real time information from the back end. So we'll listen to the back ends in real time and pick up uh, incremental data changes or deltas and uh, apply those immediately to our layer so there's no latency in the refresh of the information from the back end. And we store this on disk, not in memory. The challenge with storing anything in a memory cache is that memory cache is a very small amount of size. It's finite in its size. And you get into problems of refreshing that data. Either you dump it out on a regular basis because you uploaded everything into memory and then after a certain amount of time you have to upload it again to make sure it's refreshed for changes. In that time frame, you lose access in many scenarios because that is all dumped out as you're rebuilding that particular cache, which may be uh, very expensive to do. Or you're moving users in and out based on how frequently they query the system. But if you've got a, uh, an application or an environment where people come in in the morning and everybody logs in and then they log off at lunch and they all log back in the evening, you could be kicking people out before they get back into the system. You don't get any of the benefit of that stored information. So we've optimized the platform for high availability, for high performance to be able to store that data. And we can act as a full standalone LDAP directory. So for a lot of our customers now that are migrating off of legacy LDAP directories, old Sun infrastructures or CA or IBM or any of the other major uh, directory providers, uh, we're able to put their information in our directory store and then wrap it in the logic engine so it's not only available at a very high performance, highly available model, but it's also available as another source of information for us to aggregate and bring together. Now, what I'm going to be bringing online here in just a second is Ping Access. Ping Access is the front end uh, that we'll be demonstrating this particular series of uh, demonstrations with initially. Uh, one way to think of Radiant Logic is really we're the pipes in the wall. We deliver the hot water at the right place at the right time, at the right temperature, at the right pressure. 
but you need a faucet on the end of that pipe to use that water. Otherwise, you're just going to get a, a lot of information right into your face. So applications like Ping Access, Ping Federate, all the other access management solutions, all the compliance and auditing tools, everybody that consumes identity information are the faucets that fit on the end of Radiant Logic. And Ping Access itself has a web access management capabilities, mobile API, you've probably um, Either if you haven't heard about them, <laughs> they sponsored this show initially, but you probably run into their folks somewhere during the week and, and have an even deeper understanding than I'll touch on now. But there's a number of major protocols that they can uh, implement, including OAuth, uh, centrally managing identities, web centralization, uh, URL level access control, audit access of everything that goes through it. So there's a lot of uh, value to their access management layer and it is very easy to configure, very easy to put together as we've integrated it here. Um, so it is a good choice if you're looking for an access management solution. Now we have inside that environment that I just talked about three uh, constituents that we'll be going through our demo with. Autumn Anderson, um, Autumn's a, a sales executive uh, out of the East Coast. This is a company, Globex, that was a merger of an East and a West Coast uh, organization. I have uh, Ariana Bryant, who is in marketing, and then I have Angel Brown, who is probably looks like some of our, son, our teenage sons. Um, he is actually a store employee and has much less information available to him, uh, and we'll see that as we go through the system. The key here is that all three of these people come from different places within the organization, different identity stores, but I want to be able to give them a single sign-on experience. I want to be able to give them access to a common set of information but I don't want to have to build an environment <clears throat> in which I have uh, constructed different uh, application interfaces or different logon pages or different application configurations for each of those particular users. I want to build something once and reuse it over and over again. So just to give you a quick look here, and this is going to be probably a little bit difficult to see. One of the challenges with our product is, as I said, we're plumbing, we're not faucets. So you're looking at galvanized steel and threads right now. There's nothing pretty about the interface, but this is where I go to configure information in Radiant Logic. And within my profile here, I have a number of sources. This gives you a list of what I've connected to. And it's really difficult to see on this particular screen, but this is a New York domain here on the left. Uh, it's a flat domain, so when I look at it in Radiant Logic, I see it as a flat domain. But if I open up my San Francisco domain, it's a OU hierarchical domain. This is the way the domain exists on the back end. So I represent it here exactly as it exists on the back end. I keep all the structure, not just the schema and the data, but the structure on the back end. I've got an HR system where people are identified by employees. So that's going to be difficult to mash together with people that are identified by uh, an OU or a user uh, CN. And now I've got vendors also, and those vendors have a completely different UID identifier because they're sitting in an LDAP directory. So I've got all these different protocols, different sources of information, my consumer databases. And if I go out to Salesforce, I find out that Salesforce is a, actually just a giant set of database tables. And in there are key field identified users that are actually very difficult to sort out because the information over here in this key field is a very strange string. But these are all used to link together all these tables. And this is Autumn Anderson's, and uh, this is a sunset profile for Autumn Anderson in Salesforce um, that we're able to virtualize right now and bring into the sandbox. Now, again, because I can bring this information in, I can then choose to go ahead and build a global profile. And in that global profile, if I go back to Autumn Anderson, and this will be easier to see when we get into the uh, logon page, you're able to actually see besides my mail alerts that I couldn't get to turn off, um, all the attributes for Autumn Anderson. And if I look in here in her canonical name, I've got her source in two places. She's coming out of the executive OU in the San Francisco domain. She's also coming out of the users OU in the New York domain. So I've mushed together here information from both uh, directories, both active directories that are untrusted into one location. If I go down a little bit lower, I'll see some identity uh, attributes here in all caps. That's actually HR information that's been added in to her particular profile. So I may have an application that needs to know her employee ID number coming out of HR, and it needs to know information about what group she's a member of in Active Directory. So I can provide that with a single call to a single location 
and be able to make an authorization decision against that information. Or as I'm authenticating Autumn, I can decide that if I want to authenticate her against the San Francisco domain, that I'll look for San Francisco domain credentials when she logs in, regardless of which identifier she uses. If that fails in San Francisco and I choose to, I can then file over to the New York domain and try there to see if that password works. But she may have used her old New York password and I didn't get the syncing working right on the back end, but I'm not gonna let her know that. I'm just gonna let her authenticate with good credentials. Or as a total fallback, I may have a third database that's the HR system that somebody put passwords in for some reason, and I can fall back to the HR system, do a password match on that. If that matches, and that's a good password, I can send her on her way. Well, this comes into play even more so is when you're talking about customer environments where I have uh, a legacy customer environment where I created a, a fire insurance or homeowner's insurance policy database. I had a life insurance database, auto. I had an Inui database. My customers were created in there separately on different systems. They may have different passwords. They may have different identifiers. But when I build my customer portal, I want to be able to give those users access to that information in a single logon and a single interface. So I don't want them to have to worry about which credentials they're logging in with. Anything they use that I can validate against any of those back ends should be good. And Radiant Logic can not only bring all this information together, it can route that data for you. Now this has gotten fuzzy again, and they say this giant projector in that screen is gonna be a little bit like that. But what I have done now is opened up a sign-on screen for Ping Access. This is Ping's single sign-on solution for web access management. And I'm gonna go ahead and log in as Autumn Anderson. Cast her credentials just for fun. And this is gonna go ahead now and go back to Radiant Logic, make the call, call back to the backend domain and verify that our credentials are accurate. Once those are accurate, it's gonna give a bind back to ping access. And then I'm loading up a web page here that happens to be filled with information coming from her global profile. And for fun, it's a little harder to see in this screen than it is online, we've color coded it. So the, the purple on the very top there is actually an attribute that doesn't exist in any of my sources. It's a full name attribute. So what I've done is I've concatenated given name in SN and AD to build a full name attribute in case I had an application that needed full name. And then I've got coming from my global profile, Anderson and E. Anderson and user ID and email. Um, office phone numbers coming from New York. The company information there in blue right in the middle is actually coming from my HR data store. So all these different sources are being fed onto the page now uh, in a single experience for Autumn Anderson. And based on the fact that she's in the sales department, as you may have seen back here, she's got sales as a department. I can go ahead and get her into the sales portal. And from the sales portal, I can go through to a number of other uh, pages. We will go into the Salesforce connector in the next section. We talk about federated access to cloud applications. Because now that I have this global profile build, I can leverage that to go into uh, SaaS applications also. But if I try and go back into a marketing portal, I'm gonna get blocked because I can look immediately at the application attributes that she has, either based on group membership or on particular attribute values, depending on how you wanna set up your access control. And I blocked her access to the marketing materials because she's not in marketing. So if I've gone ahead and logged off, let me go ahead and clear the browser and bring up another one because the nice thing about this system is that it holds on to information. And I'm gonna bring in A. Bryant just for a little contrast to show you that it's not simply screenshots that I'm going through individually, but now this is A. Bryant's information. You can see that she's in marketing, and because she's in marketing, when she tries to go to the sales portal, she's gonna be blocked there, but now she has access to the marketing information, and as marketing has always told me, don't blame us, blame sales, uh, their information is available for you to peruse through, and I can get to other pages within the system based on location information or other things that I need to control about her. Now, one last step is just to take you into the profile now as Mr. Brown, our store employee. And again, the idea here is that I have one place to go to log in and authenticate all my users, regardless of where they came from, where they authenticated. Mr. Brown doesn't have an AD account. He has no AD credentials to authenticate against, so his password authenticated against the store employee's database back in and I get a profile information for him, but it's much thinner than the one you saw because I don't have the AD information to integrate. I just have information coming out of the HR profile and his store profile. He happens to be an intern. So if I've got a scenario, and this is one of our large uh, fast food customers, 
they had a large corporate IT with everyone in Active Directory, and they had store employees. The challenge was that their stores, the average employee lasted six months. So they didn't want to create accounts for those users in Active Directory. They created them in a database. And they wanted to be able to give them those seamless access to their SharePoint online credentials or uh, documents that they use for HR, for benefits, for uh, reporting on payroll. So we were able to set up an interface where we were aggregating the Active Directory users from AD and the user profiles from the database, bringing those together into a single profile, provision that into Azure AD and set that up so that Azure AD could, could check credentials back down against either the Active Directory or we could spoof the HR database to make it look like Active Directory for credential checking. Once the user is validated on the portal, they got access to whatever resources were available to them in SharePoint online based on the, who they were. But from the company standpoint, everybody went to one employee portal, everybody got access to what they needed, everyone was managed uh, in their own repository, but they had a single source of information or, or access to those particular applications. So that is my demo of this particular function of web access management. I'd like to open up the room to any questions. I was actually going to say this at the beginning to make this as interactive as possible. Feel free to actually even interrupt me um, with questions. I do have two more sessions. Uh, another one doing something similar with federated access. That's SAML and WS Fed integration with Ping Federate. And then the third session is actually integration of provisioning account across multiple platforms and then provisioning that out to Azure AD uh, up into um, Amazon uh, domain and Amazon and propagating that across multiple internal directories and then being able to let the user manage their own attributes to pro propagate that information throughout the environment. Any questions about what we've talked about so far or? Yeah, by all means. Um, or, I see. Well, they're micing everything, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll let this. This helps the recording, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like the the harder challenge uh, is you didn't talk about, which is how do you uh, synchronize the various identities? What are whether you use heuristics or how do you uh, link up across all of these uh, various directories, and then. And then, of course, along with that, you've got to keep track of that because when you're going to query for attributes, you have to know what identity a particular uh, database or LDAP is using. Yes, that's, the, that's the, the common challenge. And again, it goes back to the idea of doing the heavy lifting once. Um, the product is optimized around a logic engine that allows you to uh, extract the information as it exists natively in the system. So when I first brought up the platform, what I had was a, a list of sources, and the system recognizes each of those sources, and it brings in the native profile and native information that comes from that back end. So although these are all right now uh, in different uh, protocols, we're, we're schema and protocol agnostic, so we're able to bring that all into one sandbox or one area to, to interact with. And then you're basically just connecting sources based on attribute matching. Now, in a, in a perfect world, 10 years ago, somebody long before you made sure that every system had a unique identifier that was never reused, prop provisioned into every platform that a user was created on. So all you had to do was match on that one unique identifier and everything fell together beautifully. Uh, that's not the way most the organizations evolved, especially if you've gone through mergers and acquisitions. No one followed that model very well. So you end up looking to see what attributes can I match on, what attributes are common across a platform. But it doesn't have to be one attribute across all of your systems because we can match in a chaining model. I can match A to B based on a particular attribute and then I can take B or that union and I can then match from an attribute in that union to another attribute in another platform uh, to be able to uh, maybe first of all coordinate on email address between two domains but then I can take uh, a employee ID number uh, across two other platforms, or I can use a user ID in different platforms. The challenge is that, that the pattern matching, the heuristics that we can use, all the different uh, processes for doing that get an iterative slice at the full set of identities in your environment. We've not yet met a customer where we're able to sweep through the whole environment with one set of logical matching rules. You slice the pie and get the biggest half you can the first time with the rules you get are most easily applied. 
And then you come back in and, and take another slice at the pie with another set of rules that are a little bit more fuzzy uh, and get a larger set of the, of the user population. You'll eventually end up uh, benefiting from the fact that you'll find the last 10, 15 percent of your environment that are orphaned accounts, that are abandoned accounts, that are accounts that were provisioned by someone and they misspelled something, they, instead of deleting it, they just left it and started over. All this information that's sort of sitting as garbage within your environment that you can't normally easily see until you start to correlate and find out the, the ones that are left out of the cycle. We also have uh, a number of customers that have, have added on a, a feature and we have a, a partner that provides us as a service the ability to uh, provide the user with a portal that says this is your primary identifier that you log in with but here's another account I believe belongs to you based on the matching rules I have. If you can authenticate to that account, I will link it to you. And from that point forward, that account will be part of your global profile. If you don't recognize it or you can't authenticate to it, just check the box. I'll put it back in the pool and we'll, we'll cycle it around and see if we can find someone else it belongs to. So and especially for our customers in the financial space, when you're doing any kind of linking, you need to have that verification. You need to have that last step. So at some point along the line, you're going to verify, excuse me, uh, you're going to verify the logic you've implemented or you're going to have a human being step in and, and look through that data to make sure it's clean and it's accurate. But it, it, the engine itself gives you a tremendous uh, advantage in being able to do data discovery, figuring out where unique <coughs> attributes exist, what's populated, what's not populated. And then by building hierarchical lists of the data, I can actually see the quality of my data. Uh, we have a large oil and gas company that operates in 120 companies internationally, but not as their primary name. They have the Kazakhstan oil company or the oil company of eastern Afghanistan. And what they have done is they're all wholly owned subsidiaries. So in their active directory, they populated people based on their company. But you can imagine how many different ways people in the US would spell Kazakhstan. Uh, so when you start doing a search on Kazakhstan, you get about 20% of the actual results because of all the variations and, and it's incorporated, it's LLC, it's a period at the end, it's abbreviated. We're able to go in and build a hierarchical view that says, let me see the organization by company and all the companies are listed down the tree and I can see all the variations in the way these objects have been identified. And then within the tool, I can go back in and do a simple rule that says for all these variations, just output Kazakhstan.llc spelled properly so that whenever I do a search, whenever I do a matching, whenever I do anything against that data, I'm actually querying on a normalized value. Even though the back end sources are still an absolute mess, the data I'm working on appears to be cleaned up. So I'm not relying on people on the back end to fix their data. I can do that in the tool and now I can match on a common company name across 50% more records because the information has been cleaned up on the back end. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, hey, wait. Um, hey. So early on in the presentation, you had the, the cube with the uh, accesses of apps and users, and then the last one was devices. Yep. Um, and and you, you mentioned the use case of, uh, you know, a, a CIO using his son's <laughs> Uh, jailbroken phone. So uh, are you guys doing anything from that uh, device standpoint in order to address some of these concerns? Well, one of the nice things about the application, and, and again, we're, we're an identity broker. We're, we're a, a, a faucet, uh, we're a pipe feeding identity information. But more and more now we're seeing either mobile device management solutions or even risk-based access control uh, being built into the authentication or the authorization layer. And, and those systems reply, rely on a very rich set of information. The, the more you can know about the endpoint, the more you can make a decision based on the value of that information. But you need to be able to correlate that back to the identity that you're authenticating or authorizing, and you'd be able to do it at the speed of a directory. So we're not going to be the endpoint that collects the data off that device. That's something you're going to get from an edge device, potentially, that's listening to it. But that edge device creates a data set that says, hey, this device on this IP address has all this information. Great. We grab that, correlate it on the fly with the user profile information, and now your risk-based solution can say, hey, this user is trying to authenticate, and by the way, I know all this about his device right now based on what my edge device just told me about what he's using at the moment. So it allows you to incorporate that data much more quickly and effectively, but we're not going to be the actual collector of that information. But because we're schema agnostic, 
those are a lot of you know, schema extension attributes you wouldn't normally find in Active Directory. You can't put all that in car license. So we let you go ahead and build that extended view so your risk-based uh, system is now looking at a profile that has both user and group and department and, and HR information and it has device information and it has potentially live information coming in off the perimeter. Does that match up with what you're looking for? Yeah, so it, it, there is a facilities in the directory that pulls that information in or it has the synchronization capabilities, but It's basically, if we have the ability to contact or talk to the, the edge device, um, and we're working right now with integrating TACX in the Cisco model. So it's a protocol that allows us to actually be either query or send back information to, the, to a perimeter, a hardware device that uses TACX as a protocol. Um, and the nice thing about the platform is, again, because we're, we're agnostic, we can take information that may have existed in AD and format it into the protocol and into the schema that TACX will understand. And the values are information we're filling in, but the structure is one that's expected on the endpoint. So we can take the information we've correlated, reformat it, translate it into the right protocol, and deliver it in a way that the endpoint can understand it and act on it. Or we can pull information out of that endpoint populate our in general store, turn around into a REST call and provide it to a, a mobile device management application that's making decisions. So you have uh, ability to move the data around and deliver it just as it's needed. And that's the repetitive process that we, that we do that really kind of solves a lot of problems. Okay. Yeah, it would be good to see a presentation on that at some point. Sure. Oh, up here, yeah. We have a unique situation. We have about 10,000 identity repositories in our environment. Okay. I'm and sorry. we discover them <laughs> dynamically. So as they come online, uh -huh. the first time the user authenticates, we discover that new uh, um, repository mm -hmm. doing a directory service lookup. Not user directory, but a service directory lookup. So we want to be able to provide a way so that we can um, paint the relationships of users across the different repositories into a product like yours, mm -hmm. but we don't want to copy the actual user credentials. Mm -hmm. Do you support a model that basically would allow us to A, dynamically discover new repositories, and then B, to be able to actually route to those rather than moving the data or replicating the data from that repository into your product? Um. As far as dynamic discovery of the information, it's probably something we could do. I'd have to actually get back with an architect because the, the normal configuration is, a, is a, uh, a connection to the back end that has authorization to read that back end. So like you would talk to an Active Directory or, or a Salesforce, uh, we have a service account. Uh, they control uh, that service account and what access we have. So being able to dynamically pick up an endpoint, um, when you query that, Yourselves, what do you? How are you connecting to the back end today? We're doing it for risk-based stuff. Okay. So what, essentially, what happens is you when it comes online, you software comes online, they inject themselves into your service directory, and then you can dynamically discover them from that. Okay. So use our third pass from our SSO to the uh, repository. Right. But what we don't have today is a way to link identity across services. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect then, because we, we support a REST interface on the back end, so if, if you can get to them through REST, then we can get to them through REST. Um, you have the option here in the platform, and let me go back to, to this model here. When I'm connecting to the back ends, I have options as to whether or not I want to store any of that back end data at my layer, or whether I want to simply make proxy calls to the back end. So when I'm making proxy calls, I built a map that says, here's all the places this user exists, so when I need information about that user, I can go back to that particular location. Um, in fact, let me slide down here to uh, an example that may fit your scenario even. Uh, here we go. This is a little bit different. This is, this is a little more harder, real world, in terms of uh, the nature of the physical environment. But similar model here, this particular uh, company has uh, nine bottlers that they've acquired. And those nine bottlers all had individual active directories. 
and they wanted to provide single sign-on to the users in those directories, and when they put in uh, their, their, federal, their web access management solution to access those back ends, uh, the challenge they had was that the traditional model is to go and search those back ends in series, looking for the user that's trying to authenticate, because you don't know where he is. So you look in directory A or data page A, if you don't find him, you go to B, if you don't find him, you go to C, and when you get to the seventh one, you find him, and then you go ahead and authenticate his credentials, and he's on his way. Well, that generates a massive amount of calls to the back end, and a lot of traffic and a lot of waiting. Uh, and if you remember, uh, healthcare.gov rollout, that was an attempt to, in real time, make calls back to databases to pull information to correlate that. And that takes way too long to, to work. So in this particular scenario, we brought in Radiant Logic. It's a federated identity service layer. Connecting to the back ends, you do it to REST, to the back end sources that you're talking to. And then we pull forward just the identifier, just the user ID. We leave the rest of the record behind. But that gives us one flat list. So when the user comes into the system and tries to authenticate, the first question is, does he exist? Yes, he's on my list. Great, here's his credential, please authenticate it for me. Awesome, I know where I got him in the first place, so I route that credential back to the back end. Now in that profile, I've also joined all the other places that I found that ID, and however I match them, the logic engine, you can decide how you're doing your matching, what you can match on. But I have now, not only his ID, but I have his ID and a map back to each of the sources he came from. So whatever set of credentials he provides me, I can route back to that back end and, and check the ones until I get a positive bind. And I can choose on an attribute by attribute based level what information I want to pull up and store locally and what information I want to proxy to the back end. I can always leave the credentials on the back end, which is usually what's done if the back end has enough performance to provide a reasonable experience for the end user. Now, if we're storing information at our level, we can also encrypt that data. Um, so the data stored at rest is encrypted, the data that's backed up is encrypted, whenever the data leaves the wire going forward or backwards, it's gonna be encrypted. So you have additional layers of security in there when we're handling data uh, to have it as tightly controlled as you want to control it. What's the consuming application? Is it like a user portal that comes into the front to? Um, yeah, we have a job in that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right? And so every point has its own repository. Mm-hmm. You can't merge them together because it's a semi-transient stuff. Yeah. Segregate them for a reason. Yeah. 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 And you have the option here when you, when you create the view that's consumed by the application. The nice thing about the, the virtual directory and the federated identity layer, federated identity layer lets you both store information and virtualize it simultaneously. And the key with virtualization is where we, where we break the, the directory stranglehold is directories are traditionally, they're designed this way. I mean, it's, it's just the way they were built. It's one schema, it's one structure, it's one protocol. So when you are trying to represent multiple different worlds to the outside from, a, from an, a solid object that won't morph, you have a challenge. With Radiant Logic, you can take those identities and re-represent them in different views. I can have one view where I've combined the identities from my CRM system and my uh, purchasing system into a single profile, and another view that's just my CRM profiles, and another view that's a massive profile of a whole bunch of information from multiple places. And then I can decide what applications can contact that data, when they, what can consume it, what authorization they need to have, and even set ACIs on those structures to make it even more granularly controlled if I want to. Yep, go ahead. One more question. Sure, all by all means. Yeah. We've, we've done integration out of the box with Ping One, um, and one of, the, one of the reasons we were working with Ping One, the particular customer, was that um, Ping One didn't have a, at the time, and I, we're in the software business, so this is 12 months ago, I don't know how fast they, they moved, but the challenge was they wanted to see across all of their Ping One directories, so they create multiple directories in Ping One from a single interface so they could manage on an administrative level top down and still let the interfaces have their own autonomy. And that's the same thing we see with organizations where like the 
large state organizations, every department in the state has its own Active Directory, who has its own Active Directory admin, who is his own chief in his own department. He's never letting go. But the whole state needs to be able to audit and provide services and take everybody up to the cloud as one big group, so you have to be able to bring together and allow to be separate. So for Ping One's directory, that was part of the value add that we had was that global view where they didn't have a, a master console where I could see across everything and manage it that way. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay. um, so just to reiterate something you mentioned, but I wasn't sure if I understood it right. Sure. Is it by default that uh, Radiant Logic will actually pass through the password to the backend services to have that validated, or it will bi try to bind against the passwords that it has cached? It, the, I'll sound a little bit like a politician, because one of the things with Radiant Logic is you have choices. At every point, there's probably five ways to do something. <coughs> Three of them are really good. One is perfect for your scenario. And the nice thing about Radiant Logic is you can try one. If that doesn't work, you can flip a switch, click a box, and try another scenario. So for a lot of customers that have highly available backends, like, like Active Directory, we proxy to the backend. The credentials stay at AD and AD, and every authentication call goes through us to the backend, and then gets a bind gets applied to the front end. Um, and one of the benefits of that is, is that we've enabled for LDAP applications a number of our customers two-factor authentication without them having to make any changes to the LDAP application. So what they've done is they've implemented a two-factor authentication, they've registered their users in their RSA or their, or their uh, Okta single two-factor or uh, semantic, wherever it might be, and we connect through that through an API call. The user logs in through the application through the regular username and password login, but at the end of their AD password, they append their six digit code they got off their RSA token or off their phone or whatever they were given that, that pin. Or a Yubico key in their machine, they tap that. <laughs> they will take that message and will parse it at the Radiant Logic level, will send the AD user ID and credentials back to Active Directory to authenticate the password. And then we'll take the user ID, translate it into the mapped ID that's used in secure ID because it's different and send the token over. If both of those come back as a positive response, we'll then give a bind back to the LDAP application. The user gets two-factor authentication. The application never changed. They didn't have to do anything different. You didn't reconstruct anything. It all happens on the back end. Now, there are scenarios where my back end may be a database, and my database may be down for four hours every weekend for backup and maintenance, and I need it available 24 by 7 because I have people now authenticating to that to get access to applications around the world. So I can store that database information at the Radiant Logic level. The database is still the source of truth, but I have a copy. I listen on the back end through triggers or change logs or redo logs, however I can listen to the database for changes to apply them in real time. And if I get an authentication request, I'm going to service that locally at the Radiant Logic level because I already have the credentials there because there's a period of time the back end's not available that I want to be able to authenticate. Or there is a scenario where the back end is just too slow to respond, so I want to give that authentication at the speed of a directory so I do it locally. Now, we had one scenario with a customer where we had that all worked out, but they were worrying about, well, what about the scenario where the user has done, used our self-service password reset to reset the password on his database, and it's in that one minute window between syncing that you haven't caught it yet. I don't want him to experience that bad password, because he's going to change his password and he's going to log right in. We said, okay. We put a little bit more logic at our layer and said, if the password fails at our layer, hop back to the back end. If it answers, check the password there. Because if he just changed it, it'll be good. And then we can go ahead and give him a bind and let him in. So even that little window that we could have had an overlap of you know, syncing, we're able to build an exception that hops out and takes care of that issue for them. So you have, again, the option. Uh, and it's a checkbox. It really has to do with tuning for performance, uh, how available the back end is, and then what your your integration is you're looking like to, to provide. So one last question. Sure. Um, what is the, what's your extension model in, in Radiant Logic? Is it scripting? Is it uh, Java classes and jars? Is it? The, uh, the, the platform incorporates what we call interception scripts, which are Java classes and jars. 
that are, it's a Java-based application, so you can, you can build those to extend the platform. Um, probably the, the, the key thing to understand with Radiant Logic is that the product has been built, again, for the last 14 years over uh, customer-driven uh, features in the product. A lot of times we'll, we'll go through a demonstration with a customer and they'll say, wow, that's amazing. That's exactly the problem we have and you already solved it. Because someone brought us that problem three years ago and we solved it then. The two-factor authentication that I just mentioned, that was actually done with interception scripts by Domino's on their own. They had the product, they understood how it worked, they understood the concept, I can split the authentication into two cycles, why don't I just go ahead and put a script in here and split this? We thought that was an amazing use of the product, so we went back and actually incorporated that. There's configuration screens now in the setup in the GUI where you can decide on your end back end source and the string connections to the, to the two-factor authentication piece. So it's all incorporated in, in the product. Now you don't have to write a script to do it. So a lot of scenarios where initially something may be an extension, um, if you've got a external training system where I've got SAP uh, financials and I'm, someone can't actually get in and do things in SAP until they pass the SAP course, which is handled by a third party. Then I can say, before I authorize you to this group, I'm going to hop out to the third party application, query your identity, see if you pass the test. If you did, I'll come back, add you to the group, and now you're on your way with access to the right SAP resources. That would be a, an interception script you'd write for that particular customized scenario, but it's very much easily extendable in that way. And we can help with those too if we need to. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> I do that because I don't write code. Um, so I actually, for me, it's, it's, it gets gray and fuzzy when, when it's no longer a GUI interface. Um, I'm able to, to do everything. I built this whole demo, and there's more of it in here, um, all through the graphical interface and all through using the, the tools that are here without writing any programming. Uh, the last, honestly, the last thing I programmed was on punch cards uh, in Fortran. So um, I misuse the term sometimes because it, for me, I, it's it's a little bit of a, a gray space still in terms of of all those pieces. Um, and now I understand that all I really need to worry about in the future is rest anyway, right? So. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, great. And, and what I'm gonna do is we have, again, this is sort of built as three sessions. The, I vary the content to some degree to try and give three sessions worth of variety. But I'll go through the, the next session a little bit more quickly. The third one is, is more uh, independent in terms of the nature of the data. So um, we may just go ahead and, and roll right on through so that I don't keep anyone uh, longer. Uh, let me go back up here. <coughs> There we go. So this is basically so what we just talked about in web access management with federated access or cloud access to applications. Um, and again, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more quickly because most of you, I think you're still the same group, but you've heard the information already. Um, there is a live performance at the end. If you're familiar with the world we work in, the challenges that we deal with. Uh, on the federated access layer now, uh, what we're actually dealing with now instead of web access management in shims and the web servers, um, is we're doing uh, SAML or WSFED or OAuth or OID Connect. We're using a standard protocol to disconnect authentication and authorization from the identity source and from the application. And I went to the Ping Identity Summit in, uh, in Napa was four years ago now uh, and was talking to someone about this and I thought, this, this is amazing. I've been in this business for 20 years. We're finally getting to a point where people are writing applications where they've disconnected user repositories and authentication authorization from application functionality and we can build a homogenous single sign-on that everybody in the world can join into. And he looked at me and smiled real broadly and he says, they're not doing that. <laughs> they're still building standalone applications and they're screen scraping logins in the cloud and a lot of SaaS applications don't use WSFED or, or, or SAML at all. And I was crushed. I thought we'd actually all agreed that that's what we were gonna do. But in the, in the world where that's happening, and I think now a lot of customers, because the move towards the cloud, are able to tell the vendors, you need to be SAML enabled. You need to be able to do um, OAuth or OpenID Connect. Or, um, you need to be able to provide me with a, a single sign-on to a distributed application that we're seeing more and more of that coming into play. And we're seeing those protocols being adopted more and more now. 
Um, but again, the same challenge on the back end, whether you're, whether you're consolidating on premise or you're consolidating to SaaS applications externally, those systems want to see a single identity and a single profile with all the information they need in a protocol they understand, and that's not the way the world exists. So for the IDP world, what we've done is we have identity providers and we have potentially a common profile or common uh, protocol, so we can just chain them together. We can just add our identity providers one after another after another and easily provide single sign-on. But the problem is, is as you do this, each of these stops along the way, just like we saw with the bottling company, takes time. I'm looking through one directory and don't find someone. I look through the next directory and I don't find someone. And when you're chaining these directories together, you've got to chain on a common identifier. So now you're building a relationship between all of these to be able to hop from one to another to try and find the user, the user information that you need. This starts to affect performance. And in our market, especially on the consumer side of the business, it's very much now about user experience. Everybody wants to have Google speed and the Amazon experience. It should be fast and you should know everything about me. Don't ask me a second time for information I've given you already. Extract information from every transaction you've had with me to be able to build my profile so I have that rich experience when I go into a system. If you don't provide that, and this is something that um, Microsoft said three years ago or so, that the login experience, you've got 230 milliseconds before the person actually physically expresses frustration that can be measured by machines. So if you put sensors on someone's head and you give them login experiences and you go 230 milliseconds without them seeing something happening that's productive, they get frustrated. Now apparently with millennials, it's even shorter. It's down to 70 or 80 milliseconds before they start to feel like they're not getting what they want. I myself experienced it a couple days ago trying to get into Salesforce. Uh, I was, you know, hitting that button and the record wasn't loading like that, so I hit the button again. Now I knew that it was not meant to make it go any faster, but it's like hitting the elevator button. I figured if I kept hitting that key, Salesforce would understand I was impatient and needed to get its job done faster. So what happens in the customer environment is they vote with their mouse. You can easily move insurance companies in an afternoon if you want to because the first one's too frustrating to work with. They can't see all my information. This other guy's online, everything's integrated. I can do everything very quickly, very effectively. I print off what I need, it's all at my fingertips. Why not? So <clears throat> you have to be very reticent when you're doing things in the cloud, when you're doing these things, especially on the customer side, that you're able to provide that speed and that uh, full rich profile to the user experience. Now again, what we're doing with Radiant Logic is we're providing that abstraction layer, focused again around prim primarily access management. The key feature here is that with Radiant Logic, we're building a hub instead of a bridge. And the value of a hub is that once the information comes into the hub, it can go anywhere. And this is the model that airlines use now. We don't fly nonstop everywhere. Luckily, I got a nonstop flight out here from San Francisco to Chicago. But in a lot of scenarios, we fly into a central hub like Denver and then we fly off to the destination that we're going to. Because for the airlines, that's a much more efficient way to move users or move passengers around. And they can cover a lot more area with a lot less resources. Same model within identity management. When you bring everyone together to one place and then distribute that to your applications, it's far more efficient, far easier to support, far less cost, far more flexible than building individual connections between every consuming application and every backend that you have, especially if you get into mergers and acquisitions, you inherit another company with another 25 domains and, and another thousand applications. You can imagine again the, the challenge of the crisscross of, of building all that infrastructure together. So again, we're gonna talk about, and I'll hop onto the demo now very quickly this time, uh, same set of user constituencies uh, the, the world really hasn't changed, it's just the consuming end of the application has changed and the information that we're using with that consuming end of the application has been modified. And now in this particular scenario I'm using Ping Federate. Ping Federate will be talking to Salesforce to do just on time provisioning into Salesforce. A lot of applications though don't provide or support just on time provisioning. Uh, just on time provisioning is, is a function that says I don't need a copy of the user account in my application until they want access. When they arrive with their token from your federated access solution, they'll arrive with enough profile information, enough information in their claim for me to build their profile on the fly, authenticate them against you as a federated access layer, 
and then provide the user access to the application. And then within the application, you can associate more rights and more authorization on, against that profile. That's a really nice way of getting people into a system because you don't have to preload all those users into the platform. But again, it's not supported in a lot of places. So in the scenarios where you don't support just on time provisioning, you want to look at how am I going to get my profile information from my on-premise up into my cloud app because I have to have a local copy of the user. Otherwise, the application in the cloud doesn't know what authorization, what access to assign that user. In Salesforce, I have an ID because in Salesforce, I see certain information based on my role in the organization, my geography, the accounts that I manage, and all that information. So one of the things you can do with Radiant Logic, in addition to the authentication and authorization, is you can bring together information from all the sources on the back end, whether it's my AD department and title and location information, my Salesforce information out of my HR or my sales databases, other information even from external partners, build that global profile, and then provision that into Salesforce automatically. So when I'm added to a particular group on premise, that triggers a event, that event then provisions me into Salesforce. When my profile changes on premise, that change is reflected immediately in Salesforce. So we can provision into endpoints in the cloud, just like we do to local uh, endpoints on premise. In fact, the demo I have in the third position has a lot of provisioning built into it also, including up to AWS. So the key here is that I can provide authentication and authorization to the SaaS applications here from Radiant Logic, but also if necessary, I can do provisioning up into those particular platforms. Now, Ping Federate is a uh, federated access layer. It is a platform that allows you to create a trust, not a trust in simply the Microsoft registered term of trust, but the application layer, the, the IDP of, of Ping Federate, is trusted by the SaaS application. So if you send me a user, if you send Wade Ellery up to Salesforce on behalf of your company, I trust Wade Ellery's already been authenticated by your company. Otherwise, he wouldn't be coming to me through Ping Federate or whatever access management solution I'm using for federated access. So I don't challenge him for credentials. He has single sign-on to my platform. But I need additional attributes from him in that claim, potentially, to decide where within the application I'm going to send him, what I'm going to do with him, or how I'm going to provision him just on time. And this works with SaaS apps, with mobile apps, and Ping Federate will integrate with web applications, again, if you've got a, a SAML or an OAuth Connect option, or you can use the uh, access model, uh, Ping Access as the web access management piece. Now, I remember coming, it was, I got a lot of cloud, cloud data experience anecdotes, but this was uh, in La Jolla a couple years ago when they announced Ping Access. And they did the big announcement in the largest room, and at the end, people were streaming out right across in front of our booth. And someone came out saying, oh, man, I thought Ping had some special way to do web access management that didn't require an agent on that web server, and they'd found some magical way around that because it's just like everyone else does it. And that's sort of the nature of our industry is, is that we are uh, to some degree hostage to the systems we work on. We're not making bad decisions. We're not designing bad solutions. We're not, we're not buying products that inherently fail. There's just so much complexity and so much rigidity in some of these platforms that you end up having to use the same workaround, the same um, process to get that information to work. And that's why going to SaaS applications and going to uh, a common protocol and an IDP uh, SP model was very promising because it looked like we were going to kind of lift away from some of those uh, constraints we had on premise. But again, with Radiant Logic, you have the ability in a lot of times to work around those constraints to be able to, to take the information you have and use it in a way that uh, alleviates some of the challenges that you have. So we're going to do a quick run through with Autumn and, and Ariana and um, we don't actually have uh, Angel this time because Angel's a store employee. He doesn't get to go to Salesforce because he doesn't have that access. So let me step out of here again and just bring up my demo one more time. <coughs> Same environment here, except that now I'm going to go to oops, to my ping access. Yeah, I'm going to go up first to Salesforce just to show you inside Salesforce. I have two Autumn Andersons here already. Uh, Autumn 2 Anderson, Autumn 1 Anderson. Uh, one of the interesting things we learned about Salesforce in building this demo, and you may not run into it in your own organization, um, identifiers, which is the federated identity or federated federation ID in Salesforce, 
has to be unique across all of Salesforce. Uh, their tenant model sees everything. So if I exist as a tenant in Salesforce with a particular federated identifier, which may be my Gmail account, I can't create another Salesforce user in another Salesforce tenant with that same identifier because it's unique across the whole system. So when I use this demo more than once, I have to go back in and rename my previous users to a different identifier so that I don't end up with a conflict when it's being created. So that's why there's a couple of Autumn Andersons here with numbers in front of them. But the Autumn Anderson, the clean install, doesn't exist in Salesforce yet. So we'll see that get created in real time here. So let me go ahead and go back into my <coughs> environment, log out again. There you go. Too many browsers open. Now you wouldn't run into that in the real world because you wouldn't be logging in with two sets of credentials off the same laptop at the same time with browsers open, but I did. So I'm going to go back in as Autumn Anderson now, log into the system. Autumn's in the sales department, so she has access to the sales portal. From the sales portal, I'm going to go ahead and hit the shortcut for Salesforce. Now what's happening is Ping Federate saying, wait a minute, you're trying to go to a SaaS application. Well, let me go back and make sure that the user that, I, that you've logged in with is verified as a valid user. And if they're a valid user, then I'm going to go ahead and route them up to Salesforce. Salesforce is going to recognize that user doesn't exist, and there's a couple of flashes here in the URL as it actually built the profile just on time. And it created a profile now for Autumn Anderson, and she's brand new, so she has nothing in there. Um, <clears throat> but if I go back to my profile here and go back into Salesforce, let me refresh that, because I'm actually representing Salesforce in my view here because I'm connected to it and I go back in let's hope this is the first one because they're hard to find no nope. two and three and four maybe it's the last one one of these is autumn there we go no nope, that's one oh, it's gonna be the last one I hit isn't it it may not have synced down yet no it should be real time Anyway, I'm able to virtualize the identities in Salesforce um, and bring those into the record here. And if everything has synced properly, and I see updates on my syncing here, I got a Salesforce update here. If I go back down to my global profile that I had opened earlier, and I go into Autumn Anderson, And I show all of her attributes. If I go down here, I should see now a federated identifier. I didn't show you this before, but that attribute was not populated in, in Autumn's profile before we just created her in Salesforce. So she didn't have a Salesforce account, so she didn't have a, a populated federated identifier in our profile. But now that she's got an account in Salesforce, she has this federated identifier here. And if I go ahead and set a role for her in Salesforce, um, then I can um, I can go ahead and bring that role information back into my global profile so I have both information there for Autumn Anderson, the AD information and the Salesforce information. So if I'm doing any auditing of my Salesforce licensing, I can bring my Salesforce licensing information back down. I can bring down any group information, roles, anything I want in Salesforce that I've provisioned I can now bring back down and add it to my global profile. So when I'm doing attestation and reporting against my environment, I'm not only doing that against my on-premises application, but I'm doing that against my uh, applications here that are in the cloud. And for Ariana Bryant that we talked about earlier, she actually has also Azure AD accounts. And in Azure AD, it's probably a little hard to see there, but there's AZ in front of the fields here. Um, in fact, there was me doing some testing, more hopes, not update. Um, I was just writing anything I could in the city field to see if I could get it to sync. It did sync. Um, <clears throat> so what I have here is attributes that come from a cloud application, come from her AD online uh, identities, and also come from her uh, SaaS application if she was provisioned into Salesforce. So that gives me a, an end-to-end -end on the Salesforce 
uh, and integration with SaaS applications on that side. Any questions around this particular features, functions? Yep, go ahead. In this particular situation, we did just on time provisioning with Salesforce. So it, it queried back and said, I need information in order to provision this user. And we built the profile, gave it to Ping. Ping filled the claim out with the data and pushed the claim up that was then processed to provide the user in that scenario. Is Salesforce saying exactly, here, here are the attributes that I need so that you're not inputting more information to Salesforce than is required? Yeah, the, the configuration between Salesforce and Ping Federate in that claim, they set up a, a, an agreement on um, how that claim is mapped and what attributes it's looking for. Um, a lot of times we're seeing now with SaaS applications, they're looking for identifiers, UUIDs, unique identifiers, that don't necessarily exist on on-premise. When you start provisioning into Azure, Azure's looking for your uh, unique identifier appended with dot on Microsoft.com at the end of it. And you need to send that up to Microsoft as your Microsoft Azure ID. So with Radiant Logic, we're able to build that from your first name, last name, domain name to build an email address if you don't have one or, or a domain identifier, and then append that with dot on Microsoft.com and then send that up as a UUID up into Azure. And in the next demo, I'll actually do the provisioning piece where we're going to provision up into um, Azure and we'll provision into um, Amazon. Uh, I, and in fact, I can't provision into Azure right now, it'll already be there. Because I tested it earlier with the same ID and Azure, if I delete the ID, it sits there for 30 days unless I run a batch file to clean it out. I don't want to do all that in front of you. Because um, they, they hold things in, a, in the garbage can for a while. But I'll show you the process. Yeah. Um, we're actually uh, virtualizing the Salesforce information. So if I let me, again, this is the, um, let's see here. I'll go ahead and log back in. This is the Mariah Carey part of the, of the show. So we'll see how well this goes. So I'm logging into Salesforce as administrator now. If I go to manage users, users please and under there users there's my new autumn anderson right there so here's autumn's profile and in role it's empty because when we did just on time provisioning we didn't send any role information so i'm going to edit her profile and a role i'm going to give her senior vp of sales and marketing don't tell her she'll get a big head but she is today senior vp of sales and marketing so now I've got that in her profile in Salesforce, but I've got a connector to Salesforce that's listening to Salesforce for updates and changes. And that connector is then feeding my global profile. So if I go back to my sync monitoring, to my global profile, I'm gonna see down here in my Salesforce connector, I've got an update to is processed, applied, should have been processed here. We're gonna hope that it got all the way through. And I go back to my browser Go back into my profile, let me reconnect so I get fresh data. Go into Autumn Anderson, show all attributes. I've got the federated identifier here. It comes from there and then I should have a, uh, let's see. Salesforce role, senior VP sales and marketing. Yay, it worked. <laughs> so what I've done is I, I'm actually reading the data out of Salesforce, just like any other source, although it happens to be in the cloud, and it happens to be through a JDBC driver and databases, and I had to link the roles table to a user table based on key field matching in the background to get that join, but once I did that, I was able to populate the field here with her, and her Salesforce role ID, which is a, the key field that is matched and mapped on. Yep, Logan.
Right. No, the reverse flow is, is all us. So, um, and again, we could we could be pushing changes up into Salesforce also if and if we wanted to. Uh, in this situation, we let um, Ping Federer do the just on time. But you may do just on time provisioning, then you may come back in and augment that profile with more attributes that we push through our connector. So this is the connection string here. It's a JDBC connector to Salesforce. We've got a super account password, and then the the uh, uh, the extended identifier that, that you enable for tokens if you're using an application to access it. And now I can write up into that system. And from our standpoint, it, again, as we saw it earlier, um, it's just a giant set of database tables. So I can go into any part of Salesforce. There we go. And I can work on accounts or contacts or whatever is the information that I want to operate on. And I could format this so that I'm actually seeing in my browser tree here, not the identifier key, but the, actually the company name. So you'd be able to use it here or you can build the view with that. One thing that we talked about with one of our customers is they had um, all of their customers in Salesforce. Salesforce was a great CRM product. They had a lot of data in there, a lot of history, a lot of all the contacts for every one of their customers. Everything was in there, all their orders. But they wanted to create a customer portal and they want to make all the Salesforce information available in the customer portal but there's nothing in Salesforce that lets a Salesforce contact authenticate to be able to gain access to information in a portal. So we were able to take all the users from Salesforce, virtualize those, create a repository in our HDAP store with a password field, and then link that password to the Salesforce record so that when the user came in to authenticate, they would provide their Salesforce ID and their password that would come to us. We'd check the password locally at our level. If it authenticated, we'd give a bind back to the portal. Then the portal would query us for all the profile information from Salesforce it wanted to include in the portal for the customer. So they were able to leverage all the work they'd done in Salesforce to build this massive customer data store immediately in their customer portal and use authentication and provide authorization based on attributes without having to build anything more than just a simple join on our level. And that password, again, is encrypted and stored locally, and you have control over it. <coughs> so it was a pretty neat way to just say, hey, why do it twice? Why export all that information out into another directory? You already have it in a directory. It's already highly performant. It's already updated by all your systems. Leverage it now for your portal. Any other questions around this part of it? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and hop, we're ahead of schedule, I'm gonna go ahead and hop right into uh, the last half of this, which is, is more around uh, user-generated identities and provisioning across multiple platforms and kind of give you an idea of what we can do with this information when you start uh, exposing it to more than just internal resources. Um, and then we'll all get done a little bit early and I'll give you back a half an hour or an hour of your, of your life. Um, so this is information for customer portals, and it's not necessarily restricted to customer portals. Um, it's just, it happens to be more database driven, and, and, and that tends to be more the source for customer information. Uh, but this could easily be an incorporation of, of other uh, internal systems and, and platforms. It will be live at the end. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, people are looking for Google speed, and they're looking for the Amazon experience. You need to give people that rich profile. And as we talked about earlier, and I'll go again through this fairly quickly, unless there's questions, and feel free to interrupt with questions during this last session. Um, this is the challenge of, of connecting to multiple systems, especially with customer side, it's in databases. Databases are slow. They're not responsive. They weren't built for authentication in a lot of situations or for authorization, especially if the databases are doing joins, and you're doing queries across join tables or join views. You've got a lot of overhead there that you want to kind of abstract out of the system. So with Radiant Logic, we're able to connect to that system. And for this particular, again, this particular bottling company, they were doing 13 million authorization calls a day to those back ends to authenticate everybody. That was bogging down their traffic on top of making people wait. And they were really angry at their single sign-on solution. They were thinking it was the problem when it really wasn't. It was an infrastructure issue. So we were able to sort that out for them and get it down to 2.2 million authentication calls a day. That really cut down on their traffic overhead. It cut down on their budget for their thinking they had to bring in bigger servers, bigger routers, get some bigger pipes. How are we going to manage this kind of traffic? We can't handle this kind of external load. 
and we were able to cut it by 80%, then their infrastructure was able to run on what it already had, and that gave them a major savings going forward. The challenge, again, with that kind of search across directories or databases is that every time you query uh, one system and then the next and the next, you're adding a chain of, of elapsed times together, which is going to add to the frustration of the user and the time it takes to process things and the amount of effort you're doing. And really, most of the time spent on authenticating a user, and this is operations in SiteMinder, it can be any access management system, is lookups. It's the time you spend going across systems looking for users. So with Radiant Logic, we're able to bring all that information together and give you one place to go and do that query and that lookup. But once you've done that query and that lookup and you found that user, you may need attributes from multiple systems to make a decision about group membership, about uh, attribute-based access control, filtering for uh, perimeter-based uh, access or risk management, whatever is the scenario where you have information from multiple sources or you're building a customer profile and Again, I want to show you information on your auto policy and on your fire policy and on your life insurance policy all in the same portal. Or I want to be able to show you as an as a insurance company, here's your doctors, here's your prescriptions, here's your last invoices, here's your last payments we made for you. Those are all in different systems, different protocols, different standards, different schemas. Doing that on the fly, you get healthcare.gov. It, it, it fails miserably to be able to bring that kind of information together. Uh, and the challenge is basically, first of all, it's protocol. These systems don't talk to each other easily, so you can't just link to the back end and have everyone happily sing kumbaya and supply the data as they need it. And then as you do a join, as you actually go through and build those relationships, that's time and it's effort and it's overhead. So you're signing clock cycles on that whole process and waiting for the outcome. So at the Radiant level, as you've seen in our, in our demo so far, we're able to create that global profile that global profile is a single representation of all the attributes from all the sources in the back end that you choose to bring forward. You get to decide what attributes you're going to include in that global profile. You don't have to bring everything. There are, I don't know, 400 attributes in Active Directory. You only read about 40 of them if you're really doing a rich profile, 80 if you're really going out there at the edges. So we can bring just the set that you need into the system. Um, also, one of our customers said that uh, we were getting pretty good performance out of Radiant Logic, you know, 10 times faster than we were getting out of the competing directory that we were replacing, but it still wasn't what we thought we were going to be getting. And then we realized we're pulling the JPEG file every time we create a user object. So when we exclude a JPEG file except when asked for, the uh, performance went up by a factor of 1,000. So they were able to get much more throughput out of the system based on what you bring through and what you filter. But once it's in the Radiant Logic platform, again, it's in that common format. It's all aggregated, correlated, and then we can translate and transform that information. One of the things I'll touch on a little bit later, too, is the idea of hierarchy. Because once you've brought data into a system, it's not just the value of the data itself. It's the value of the relationship that data has to other data. And again, if you think about the medical industry, if you think about this hierarchy, the structure here is, I have a doctor, a doctor has patients, the patients have prescriptions, the prescriptions are filled by pharmacies, the pharmacies uh, are paid for by certain insurance companies, and that creates a set of relationships. But if you look at a, a broader set of, of users, you start to see lots of relationships there, and you see a doctor with many patients, with many prescriptions, but then that particular prescription may be prescribed to three different patients and, and fulfilled by two different uh, pharmacies and paid for by the same insurance company. So you end up with this very convoluted potential set of relationships, but they're difficult to represent in, in, the, in a world that applications can understand. But with Radiant Logic, what you're able to do here is build multiple views of the data, multiple hierarchies, multiple structures. So in the first structure here, number one on the bottom right, I can build a fairly linear tree of relationships as I go down doctor to patient to drug to pharmacy to insurance company, and that information is available and can be queried for that particular purpose. But in number three up there, I may be actually looking at a drug, and I'm looking for, for that where it's prescribed, and then I'm looking for drug interactions and overlays with other drugs because I have rules that separate prescription assignments. So now I can take the same set of data, look across my entire environment, and say, where are all the places this drug was, was prescribed? in conjunction with another particular prescription and see that information contextually. Now the challenge here is how do I provide this information back to the back end and how do I represent it 
without standing up a different infrastructure, a different directory, a different database and tables and views for each of these outcomes. I don't really want to build platforms for all this. So the value of this relationship data gets lost because we don't have an easy way to make that work. But in Radiant Logic, I can create multiple views of my data. I can take one set of data, and this looks like an LDAP structure, but this could be database tables that are linked together within Radiant Logic that are unconnected in the back end. So now I'm managing here by org chart. It's manager, and then it's fulfillment hierarchy, and then it's actual user down below, all the way down to the management uh, scale within my organization. So if I've got a, um, a HR system that needs to know things by organizational chart, needs to be able to segregate information or access ba based on that, I can build that particular profile. If I have a profile based on location, I've got county, country and state and city, then I can do this. If I've got uh, auditing compliance reports that are different by region, then I can build this particular hierarchy and show the users within a region within a certain set of regulations, especially if you're talking internationally and the challenges of dealing with other countries. Or I can build something on role and location and territory. These are just examples of taking the same data. These are all the same profile information, same user objects, but reorganizing that information so it's available for different functions and different purposes. And that gives context now to the data that you don't normally have. And this is all done with our context builder tool. It's a graphical interface that lets you join and build relationships between these objects in a way that gives them more value. Uh, my refrigerator at home probably has an identity with GE, but does it know where I live? Does it know if I have a credit card on file with GE for purchases? Does it know if I have a warranty program with GE for my water filter? All that information when it's brought together allows GE to run a process that says, hey, this refrigerator needs a new filter. I've got a pre-authorization credit card. I've got a shipping address. Let's get that filter on its way out. We made another $1.85 but I took that information and got value out of it, where individually those points of information in a giant data lake are nice, I collected them, but I'm not using them, I can't leverage them. So with Radiant Logic, I can build that kind of information store together. But the key is when I build those complex relationships with this logic engine, this very powerful tool for mapping all that information, I wanna store that information, I wanna store it in a highly available directory store so that I can get to that information at the speed of a directory. I don't want to do that complex joining on the fly. I don't want to build that information as I need it. I want to be able to pre-build it, recognize changes on the back end, and have that highly available. The problem with this is that traditional LDAP directories start to fall down about 3 million users. Uh, the problem with a traditional LDAP directory is that when you bring up multiple directories in order to provide throughput for a larger set of users, you have to replicate between the directories to keep everything in sync. That replication traffic starts to compete with the user access traffic. I spend more time rearranging the product on the shelf than I do letting customers in the store to buy things. And eventually, at about 3 million users or a certain level of load, the system stops responding because it's too busy doing housekeeping on the back end. And again, it's not a fault of any one vendor. It's inherent in the design of the product. What we did is we actually stepped back three years ago and said, this won't scale for our customers. We've got customers with 100 million identities in the insurance industry that they need to be able to manage and correlate. And instead of building this cascading level of hierarchical bridgehead directories servicing and correlating directories, correlating directories to get nothing more than 3 million in a set of nodes, I actually, we actually went back and rebuilt the system under uh, Hadoop big data technology using Lucene and Zookeeper. So we do block level replication between our nodes. It's, it's a thousand times faster than LDAP replication. It doesn't compete with the user authentication authorization, so our performance curve is extremely flat across very heavy load. And then we did a search engine index. We used Lucene for pretext indexing from the bottom up as opposed to a B-Treve index, traditional directories index from the top down. Traditional indexes are really good at finding one user in a long list of unique users, which is great for looking up IDs for login. But if you want to find everyone in Chicago that works in large accounts that's on pharmaceutical sales, finding that information in a directory store is very difficult. And most directories won't respond to that kind of query because they don't know how to get back multiple answers to multiple queries simultaneously. But if you're doing dynamic groups, you're doing risk-based access control, you're doing granular uh, attribute-based access control, you need to be able to say, 
who is in Chicago that's in large accounts that sells pharmaceuticals because I want to give them access to this. Who is in my financial system that has a certain net worth value that doesn't have a, uh, a personal financial advisor? I need to put him in this particular list or this particular view because that's a key set of demographics I want to market to. So I want to be able to analyze that information using free text indexing and searching of all the attributes without suffering the overhead from that. So as you can see at the bottom there, traditional LDAP for a non-unique query like a, like a dynamic group is going to actually not respond where we give you a very flat response curve across uh, multiple attributes being searched for because of the way the system works. So this gives you again the performance you need when you start talking about database backends being virtualized, large data sets, large joins across large systems. So let me step out of here into the demo one more time. And this one's going to be even a little bit scarier because um, I'm going to do a few things I haven't done earlier today. I'm going to go into our portal. And this just happens to be a, a web portal that allows me to use a registration page. So what I'm doing in this registration page is I'm going to register a new user in the system. And I'm going to register Bill Blass, and he's my new, new user. Now, Bill's just coming to my web page and registering. Um, based on his identity there, I already know some information about Bill because Bill's already in my system. So as soon as Bill registers himself and creates an account on his portal, I want to be able to link that information to Bill's profile on the back end to more data. So if I go back into my back end system here and I go into my CFS demo, I'm going to be able to see now under my Globex profile, I have customers. <laughs> Maybe there's a tree there. There you go. Bill just got created. Bill wasn't there a minute ago and I should have shown you he wasn't in fact. A couple of things just happened in the background that I can't prove now because they already happened, but trust me, they weren't there a minute ago. Um, but in Bill's profile, I've got the information Bill gave me um, about his particular um, account. And if I go back into uh, my mail, I should have an email that's telling me that Bill got created and Bill should be giving me a password. There it is. Thank you, Lord. Um, there we go. Here's Bill's new password. It was just created. Now, the reason it came to me was is because Bill doesn't really exist, so he doesn't have an email account that I can log into. There we go. So I'm going to take his password from what was just created. Go back into my profile. Go back in and go to the login page. your uncle. I'm Bill. I'm in the system. So I now have access because Bill happens to be, this happens to be a federated access solution. So it gives Bill access to different applications in Salesforce and in uh, Microsoft. And under his profile here, there we go. load for a second. There we go. Um, I can edit my profile. So Bill may decide to go ahead and put in a phone number, 202-555-1212. So but before I save that, let me hop over here to New York domain and show you the New York domain. This is my users, uh, Active Directory users and computers in my New York domain. And under Bill, there is no Bill Blass in my list. I'm now going to refresh my list because I actually can show you that this did happen while we were here. And in my user profile now, I have a Bill, there he is, Bill Blass. His profile has got uh, CFS portal registration customers part of that because when I built the provisioning logic for here in a description, I filled in that information automatically. I'm going to populate his profile with the particular information that he wants. But if I look under telephone numbers, I don't have any telephone number information. So Bill's gone into his profile now for me and gone ahead and updated his data. So I'm going to let him go ahead and save that. The system's going to recognize that he saved his phone number and it's going to go ahead and propagate that information now to the endpoints. If I go out to Salesforce here 
and look at my sync monitoring, I have the ability to see that I am actually managing this information across multiple endpoints. So I'm not only sending it out to my AD domains, but I'm also sending it out to AWS in the cloud and into my graph API to Azure. So if I take a moment here and hop up into my AWS environment, and this is a server I'll show you here. We're running AWS. This is an Active Directory domain just sitting up in the cloud as another point, again, as disconnected as I could get today from everything else. And if I go into my directory browser and just sources, I can see under sources, I have an AD domain. I'm out of the AD domain now. I have, I believe these gets put into executive. Yep, there's Bill. Bill got built in the profile automatically. We mapped his OU properly and we disabled his account. We set it up there by setting the user flag in AD. And if I go into, uh, actually remote into my Azure account under Active Directory Users and Computers, I'll find him there also. And now if I go up into, let's see. Sorry? Oh, um, because I set the flag. Uh, there's a user account flag that you can set in terms of the, um, the value. Uh, and the Active Directory, I, and I set the account flag as enabled. So it's a, it's a user account control binary. So the one in Amazon I sent is disabled, partly because at times I forget to, to turn Amazon off and it's sitting up there with a lot of things open because it's just a playground. So I don't want those accounts active. Um, yeah. Is that logic inside Radiant? Yes. Yeah, logic inside Radiant, um, I've got full control over that process. In fact, if I go into my identity correlation engine here. Um, you can see it's a full set of, of rules-based tools that let you set the uh, information that you're doing, the field mapping, the conditions for those particular rules. So here's my Azure topology, and then going into my Amazon. I've got, um, basically, if I get a, uh, it's a member of the group, AW users. So this user had to be a member of AW users to go up there. It's an updated entry. I'm gonna then map CN to the SAM account name. I'm gonna apply these particular filters and I've got target mapping here so I can bring up my mapping. And under here, I've got a user account control attribute that should be mapped. There you go. And I didn't map user account control. So because I didn't map user account control, it built a default by the uh, disabled by default. I could have set this as active. I just didn't on this particular one. Yeah. So I've got con full control over all the endpoint information in terms of what I'm pr presenting in there. This also allows you to do things like recursive uh, builds. So I can say to, I'm creating a user new, new user account. Here's his ID. Here's his department and everything he's a member of. Okay, based on this, I know if I, generate a lookup on his department, I can find the department owner or I can find his manager and then I can go ahead and set his manager on his profile as I'm creating it so I can make calls externally during this process and then once I have all the data in a temporary field, write it back to the manager field and populate that. So there's a lot of neat things you can do with transforming and I apologize that is really small and fuzzy so you probably can't see a thing up here. I can, I'm kind of sitting, okay, good. Um, so let me go back up into Active Directory, Azure, and see if I've got the right AD environment. There you go, there's Bill Blass. He was provisioned into Azure AD at the same time. So instead of using um, Active a in, or Microsoft AD Connect, Azure AD Connect, um, I'm able to actually provision directly into uh, Salesforce based on events that happen. So he's self-registered. I generated accounts for him in AD and in Amazon, and then I generated account for him automatically up in Azure. 
Um, I matched him with additional data I had in my internal database, so there's additional data in his profile. Um, may be visible here. Um, Yeah, that's not all mapping back at the moment. But um, I'm able to go ahead and do all that off of a particular action. And then if I modify his account, as I did earlier when he saved his name, I go back into my users in AD, I should get now for Bill a modification of his account with a phone number, because he just populated that phone number in his profile. So he's now managing certain attributes himself through a portal, but I'm able to propagate those wherever I want within the system, on any backend, databases, directories, cloud, wherever I want them to go. And then if I'm really in a bad mood, and I think, you know what, I'm getting really tired of this guy, he's always hanging around, he's never bringing any food, um, I'm just gonna get rid of him. And this is, this is kind of provisioning 101, so uh, it's to some degree a little obvious for most of us that do this for a living, but the nice thing about it is because, again, we're already connected. If we're already connected, let us do the lifting. You know, let us do the extra work. You don't have to build this three or four or five times. If you've got a workflow and system that already does HR event provision, deprovisioning and everything, and we're connected to a bunch of platforms you don't already have connections to or we're in the cloud, send the event to us. We'll act on it for you. We'll do the last mile carry on the data. Through an API call, through Skim, through LDAP, however you want to update that information. Or we can listen to a table that you update and go, oh, look, this, this user just got flagged. I'm going to go act on this flag and do something with it. A uh, SQL table, database table, or a, a directory. Flat files we can consume. They're just going to be on a more periodic basis. There are other things we can do real time if we can recognize change. So I'm going to go ahead and just wipe Bill out because, again, nobody likes Bill. And he's gone from there. Uh, I can go back in here and refresh my profile. And there is no bill. He's gone. And if I go back into my Active Directory, if, I, uh, if I'm ahead of the sync traffic time frame here, bill should be, whoop, that mouse. Bill's gone from my system. So I wiped him out. Again, I apologize, that's very small, hard to read, but Bill's gone. <laughs> so again, a scenario here where if you're, if you're bringing everything together, not only is it a way to provide that information for consumption, for authentication, authorization, querying, but it becomes a rich data set that you can act on to for provisioning, deprovisioning, especially into the cloud. More and more now we're getting customers that need to move uh, systems up into the cloud, but they don't want to just connect all of Active Directory and who, heave everybody up into the cloud. Or you only get to go to this particular platform when you're added to this particular group. So based on that AWS domain group, I got provisioned into AWS domain. So I have full control over what we do with this. And you can build a lot of different topologies to manage different scenarios. With one tool set, again, once you've got the connections, everything else from there becomes 10% of the effort it is to use the hub than it is to build another bridge for each use case. Any other questions or from anyone or anything else I can answer? I, that's pretty much everything I've got in terms of demoing today and, and the platform explanations. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. That, the nice thing about the product is, and this is one of the sort of the cliches that I've been saying for a while now, nothing here is poured in concrete. Everything is, is adaptable and tunable. Um, the, the questions earlier about do you go to the back end for credentials or do you store them locally and check them locally, that's just a configuration change. You could actually roll out with proxying to the back end and then decide, you know, it's not fast enough. Let's cache the credentials and see if that solves our speed problem. Or I've got a, a rule that I built for provisioning to uh, this particular endpoint and I just acquired another organization and now I need to consume different users and I need to provision different endpoints. I can extend that rule so I can take the topology that I have here and simply drag another source of identity onto the table. So if I want to take global profiles and users, I can just bring another set of users onto the table, theoretically, um, and I can connect to them and, and make an event from my source on the left there now affect um, 
I think that's not pulling on because it's the same user set. So let me pull my HR system out here. There we go. There we go. So I can say, okay, now I want an event in this source to also update a new endpoint. And then I simply go into this and set up my rules and I start provisioning the rules within this system as to how I want that particular uh, interaction to work. Or if I have another source that I want to have, I can go do it the other way around. I can say, you know what? I actually want this now to update from here, but then I want to write an update back there. And I can now modify that rule. Or I could build a separate topology that used a different set of triggers and a different set of rules, regardless of my sources being provisioned or mapped someplace else. The thing you want to avoid is looping. And there's tools for avoiding that in here too. Yep. Yes. Building the um, the rules here for provisioning for this is our ICS product. I did correlation and synchronization. So when I'm doing synchronization and I'm building the connections and the rules for that, that's all done in Eclipse. Um, the graphical interface, the, the tool here for Radiant Logic, when I'm building my profiles or my views and bringing the information together, that's all done through the web interface or through a set of wizards here or through a set of command lines. We have customers that have, that have command line uh, scripted the whole process of building their environment, all their views and everything, um, and, and keying all that in. So everything we do here with a with a wizard or with a tool is, is command lineable, um, but the ICS piece is, is managed out of um, here. But once this is built, it all runs out of the graphical interface. And if I go to my sync monitoring, you'll see that very same topology is here, and traffic management, log settings, Everything I want to do here in terms of managing that can be done graphically through this interface. It's just the rule definition wizards and stuff run in Eclipse. Because they build, they're building whole Java libraries is what they're doing when you're building that uh, for you automatically. Or you can build your own provisioning libraries in, in Java, uh, I don't want to say scripts again. <laughs> yeah, J jars with the information you want to use for particular uh, functions, especially if you're doing something beyond what we do normally. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Anything else? All right. Well, excellent. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for your patience. It was a, a long step and a little bit of repetition in places, but hopefully it uh, was interesting and you found it of value. We're at the Radiant Logic booth for the rest of the week. Uh, we have we had sessions this morning with some of our customers that were talking. Hopefully you got to see those too. Any questions, I'm always available. Anybody in a blue Radiant Logic shirt, if you see them around in an elevator, grab us. We love to talk, as you can tell. And uh, stop by if you have any questions or talk to your uh, account executive if you know who that is. We'd be happy to arrange any additional uh, information or demonstrations. Thank you. Yeah.